quite believe just how difficult it was choosing a sofa. I mean, there was a whole lockdown thing, but we'd spent months looking both online and in store, trying out different sofas. And even if we had decided on one, it would take another three to six months for it to be delivered to us. This is the point where a partner turned to me and said, we're just going to make our own one. <laughs> okay, see you later. Now, this was early stage DIY. I only just started to use the electric drill. So I was really hoping he was joking and would kind of forget about it. But I'm glad he didn't because it turns out it's actually really straightforward. If you're like me and don't have a card, don't worry. You can buy lumber online with just a click of a button. Just remember, once it's been delivered, it's up to you. All I needed was three materials. Wood for the base, foam for the cushions and fabric to cover the cushions with. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I did my sofa. And if you're still not convinced, all I used for the woodworking part was a handsaw. And there's no other reason other than I was too scared to use a power saw. All there is to say is, no matter what tools you have, you can still do this sofa. So let's go. As you can see, this is not quite your traditional sofa. In fact, I think it's better because you can move everything and then clean it as you see fit. This is probably one of the single biggest reason why we didn't buy a sofa because traditional sofas are just so hard to clean and maintain. <laughs> If you don't know how sofas are made, it's fascinating. But in short, they basically build a frame out of wood, put in foam, spring, or a combination of both to make the cushiony bit, and then they staple fabric all around to essentially make a giant blob. You can of course refurb your sofa, but it's often just as expensive to buy a brand new one. This is one of the reasons why you have statements like this. The average life for a sofa is between seven to 15 years. So many things wrong with that sentence, and it's not the first time I've heard these numbers being put to something that should last at least half of your lifetime. But that's a rant for another time. Let me get back to the video and show you how to make a sofa that you can maintain, upkeep, and basically treasure for hopefully your lifetime. Okay, so how do I make my sofa? The making of the sofa is actually pretty straightforward, as I'll show you now. But there's no one size fit all, so I'll be sharing my design process throughout so you can customise this sofa to what works for you. You can find the link to the plan in the description down below, so you can either build the exact same one or tweak it to how you like. One thing that I always do before I start planning is to decide on the things that are important to me. For this project, these are my four things. Every decision I had to make for the sofa was based around these, and your list might very well be different to mine. Let's start with the base of the sofa. It's made entirely out of 18mm thick birch plywood with a standard size of 2.4 times 1.2 meters. I've used a total of four sheets of plywood and with some leftovers which you've seen me used in my floating shelf video. I just found an area on the plywood that I can make two almost identical shelves and went for it. We originally wanted a five-seater sofa so it will fill the length of this wall. With the size of a plywood sheet, it's actually slightly too short and wide for what we wanted. But without wanting to do extra work for it, we just glued two sheets together to form the base of the sofa. I actually made the sofa even smaller because I wanted to expose the wood on one side to serve as a feature but also used as a side table. But it's still a comfortable four-seater, a very generous three-seater, and maybe even squeezing five people for movie night. The legs are probably my favourite part of the sofa, and we have six of those in total. Each leg is made by stacking 10 rectangular pieces of plywood with glue to make a giant block of plywood. This is the original sketch I did of the sofa. Ignoring the fact that it's a terrible drawing, I want to point out that there were only four legs in total. However, once I've seen how long the plywood is in person, I knew I had to add a leg in the middle to stop it from sagging. But why two and not just one? This is where movability came in. Moving one plywood sheet alone was difficult enough. The seat and the legs together are made of about three plywood sheets. So it'll be heavier and bulkier. Here is the grand plan. When we move, I'm gonna cut the sofa in half. Essentially, it'll become two standalone units, which can either stay that way or be put together again. I managed to squeeze out all 60 pieces I need from one single sheet of plywood. 
which does mean the sofa is a little bit lower than I would have liked. However, I really, really like that chunky look of the legs, so I prioritise that over the height of the sofa. Also, it's a loungy sofa anyway, so the height doesn't matter that much. But for reference, if a seat is too low, you might feel like you're squatting and struggle to get up from the seat. At the same time, if it's too high, your feet might dangle. So it really depends on what height you want to accommodate and the style of sofa you're going for. And I thought I'd show a bit of a real-time hand sawing for anyone who's considering doing this without a circular saw. Definitely doable, but let's just say I wouldn't recommend it. After going through about a litre of glue, you just sit back and relax and wait for 24 hours. So now you have what looks like a platform, it's time for the seat back. This is basically a piece of plywood stood up by four right angle triangle pieces. Each triangle piece is then glued and screwed to the back. We put one screw on the short side and once we're able to stand it up, we then put another screw from the other side. Don't forget there's a link in the description down below for the plan of this sofa. For the record, don't do this by hand. For some reason, at the time we thought it would be more hassle to change out the drill bit. It wasn't. To attach the back to the seats, we drove two screws from underneath and up into the triangles. This was more than enough to make it really secure. So that is it, that is the sofa base done. So how long did it actually take us? Well, putting aside all the hand sawing, because that alone took me about five days because I was taking it slow. Aside from that, it took us in total about four days to do, and that includes all the sanding, waiting time for glue to dry, for the finish to dry, and it was over Christmas and New Year, so we took it easy. You can definitely do it quicker if you wanted to, or, you know, if you have a circular saw. What about the cushions I hear you say? Well, being a unconventional sofa, you could do anything really. We used a spare duvet and some cushions before we found a more permanent solution using the foam. The cushions are basically high density foam that were cut to order, and then I made some custom coverings using upholstery fabric. Part of the challenge is I wanted to avoid any seams showing from the front of the sofa, which turned out to be quite a task for these oversized cushions and pillows. I'll cover how I make these in a separate video. If you've made it this far, I'm assuming you're at least considering making your own sofa, whether it be this one or something else. So let me know down below if you'll build this sofa and what size you'll build it to. Are you a lounger? Are you an upper right sitter? Upright sitter, that's it. Are you tall? Are you short? Can your feet touch the ground with your current sofa? I hope you learned something new and I'll see you next time. Can you film me? Yeah. Uh, are you planning on making a I'm going to make a cut for that big one first. Then I cut for the small one, and I'll cut for the this one. So it won't wrap all the way around, because it's not white. What does it smell like? It's so heavy.